ask unanimous consent to engage in a colloquy with my Republican colleague. Without objection. We are in the midst of a uh, debt crisis, I think some of it created by the President because he has refused to take off the table the fact that we would default on our debt. I think that's irresponsible and without a doubt the President should come forward and say that he will pay the interest on the debt. On our side, we've been willing to compromise all along. We've been offering plans. We've passed two plans in the House. Now we have a plan before us, a Democrat plan to raise the debt ceiling. And there are some of us who would vote for this Democrat plan who might require some amendments or some compromise. There would have to be some input from our side. And yet, even though this bill was introduced yesterday and Republicans said they would vote for it, the Democrats are now filibustering their own bill. What's well, funny, they filibuster their own bill and then point fingers and say, we're trying to stop things. We're here today to try to move things forward. And so in the spirit of trying to reach a compromise before the deadline comes, I would ask unanimous consent that the vote on the pending cloture motion occur immediately or as soon as possible, 5 p.m. today. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Reserving the right to object, under the filibuster rules of the Senate, there is a requirement of 60 votes for cloture. We have said that we are prepared to move to a timely vote on this pending amendment, a majority vote, the same as the vote that Speaker Boehner had in the House. And I would object unless the Senator from Kentucky wants to amend his unanimous consent request to make it clear that this will be a unanimous consent which I have spelled out here in detail if he'd like me to present it. Reserving the right to object, I Just would uh, remind mm -hmm. the Senator that uh, there is a difference between the Senate and the House. Our founding fathers gave great power and leeway to the Senate. We were meant to be a check and a balance against uh, unbridled enthusiasm sometimes from one party or another, and so I would object to that motion. Is there objection to the original request? Object. Objection, sir. Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to present an amendment. This amendment would be an amendment to the Reed Bill, and under this amendment, what would happen is I have at least 10 Republicans who will vote for the Harry Reed Bill, which would allow a compromise, which allow the debt ceiling to rise. I know the President is worried about having campaign time. He's worried about getting back out and doing some fundraisers. He doesn't want to consider the debt ceiling again before his election or his re-election campaign. So this amendment that I would offer would allow us to move forward in a bipartisan way. All Republicans are asking for is that we balance our budget gradually over a seven to eight year period. What this amendment would do, and that I'm asking unanimous consent to present, is an amendment that says that we will raise the de debt ceiling contingent upon passage of balance budget amendment. And I would ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to present this amendment to the Reed Bill. Is there objection? Mr. President, I object. Objection is heard. See, I think what this illustrates is that, you know, compromise, everybody says, you know, the pundits say that compromise is the, the mark of an enlightened person. We're trying to compromise. I just offered to pass the leader's bill. I've offered to work with them. I'm from the Tea Party. They say we won't compromise. I'm willing to raise the debt ceiling. In fact, we worked on a motion that's gotten more votes than any other motion that's been set forward, and that was cut cap and balance that would have a required a balanced budget amendment to be passed, but would have raised the debt ceiling. What do we hear from the other side? Intransigence. Who's refusing to compromise? Sounds to me like the other side's refusing to compromise. I have with me my uh, distinguished colleague from Utah, and I'd like to hear his thoughts on uh, where the fault lies and where we could come to if we were to compromise to try to find an agreement. Mr. President, a number of us, myself included, have been arguing since January, ever since we arrived here and were sworn in in this very room, that the national debt is a permanent problem. The almost $15 trillion that we now owe as a nation is permanent. It's going to take a long time to pay off. There are people who are not yet old enough to vote. There are people who will be born in a few years, who are not even here, who will one day have to assist in paying off that debt. 
Now, the fact that this is a long-term problem means that it requires a long-term solution. That's why we've been saying all along that we ought not raise the debt limit yet again. Extending our national debt by another $2.5 trillion dollars, more or less without a permanent solution in place. Herein lies the problem. It's difficult or impossible for one Congress to come up with a set of budget numbers that will necessarily bind future Congresses. We can come up with a plan to cut two or three trillion dollars over a 10 or a 15 year period. But if future Congresses don't want to go along with that, they can find a way out of that. This has happened again and again, as we've seen with Graham Rudman Hollings, as we've seen with the PAYGO rules. Congress becomes a walking, breathing waiver unto itself. We need a permanent solution. This is why we've settled on the need for a balanced budget amendment. Now, as my distinguished colleague, the junior senator from Kentucky, has just pointed out, there is no intransigence in our position. Those of us who identify with the Republican Party, those of us who identify with the Tea Party, are people who want a solution. We were sent here with a mandate by voters. A mandate that says the federal government is too big and too expensive. Now, resistance to this message from the other side of the aisle, as vehement as that resistance may be, is not genuine if what it says is that this instance, insistence, the insistence for a balanced budget amendment, is itself reflective of an unwillingness to compromise. There are myriad opportunities to compromise within that general framework. We've offered that. We've extended that. Republicans have now submitted no fewer than two bills that have passed the House of Representatives to address the debt limit issue, uh, both of which have stopped dead in their tracks over here without, uh, without further opportunity, most importantly without a response uh, by the Democratic Party in the Senate or otherwise. So if there is either party in this discussion that is refusing to compromise, it's not ours. If there is any group that has failed to offer solutions, it cannot be described as the Tea Party movement. I ask my colleague, uh, the, the junior senator from Kentucky, do you see any, any element within the Tea Party movement, any element within the Republican Party that is unwilling to compromise or that's wanting to block just for the sake of blocking? No, from going to hundreds of Tea Party rallies and grassroots rallies with voters across America, what I see is they want what's best for America. I don't think they really particularly care whether it's a Republican plan or a Democrat plan. They want what's best for America, but they want a solution. And the problem with the debate here in Washington is all of the proposals seem to want to add more debt. We have $14 trillion worth of debt. And both the Republican and the Democrat proposal, we're going to add seven to eight trillion dollars more in debt. What I think the folks in the Tea Party and those who are concerned about passing along this debt to their kids and grandkids want, I think what they want is us to spend less. You know, I think a great contrast to what illustrates the problem here is that spending's going up seven percent a year. Nobody's really talking about cutting that spending. They're talking about cutting the rate of growth of that spending. And there's a new pl plan out called the One Penny Plan. It would actually have real cuts of one penny on every dollar spent. The other side pulls their hair and says, oh, you're so radical. And we say, we just want to cut one penny out of every dollar of government spending. Is that radical? And so the president has said it's a dysfunctional place. He is right in that sense. But I think some of the dysfunction comes from the hypocrisy or from the other side not really listening. For example, the balanced budget amendment. They say that uh, polls show routinely 75% of Americans are for it. And routinely, about 14% of Americans seem to be approving of this body. So the question I would have is, maybe it's that we're not listening well enough. Maybe we're not doing what the people want. That certainly appears to be the case. And it's a reminder to us of the fact that no matter how much we might be tempted at times to demagogue this issue, no matter how tempting it might be for certain members of this body to cast blame elsewhere, they cannot escape one simple fact, which is that the American people are demanding more. They're demanding that we spend less. They're demanding that we stop this barbaric practice of perpetual, massive-scale deficit spending. Why? Well, because it erodes individual liberty. It takes money that people have not yet made and spends it and obligates them 
to repay it, in some cases before they're old enough to vote, in other cases before they're even born. And so we need a permanent solution. When we put something in the Constitution, it serves as a permanent reminder of the fact that we as a people have made a decision and we're going to move forward. Not everybody uh, will necessarily agree as to how best we should move forward, having made that decision. I think the other thing, when people talk about Washington being dysfunctional and they are upset with what's going on in Washington, I think one of the things that upsets people is hypocrisy. People who say one thing and do another. And, you know, it really is, that's, that's a sad state of affairs. Uh, sad, sad state of affairs. People run on one idea and then they completely change their ideas. The president was a U.S. senator. He spoke on this floor and here are his words. In 2006, the fact that we are here today debating raising the Amer America's debt limit is a sign of leadership failure. See, it was sort of pointing fingers. Everybody's pointing fingers. It's someone else's fault. See, I call that sort of the empty partisanship, but his conclusion then, that voting to raise the debt limit would send a bad signal. It would send a signal to our leaders that they're doing the right thing. I've often said that there's no objective evidence that Washington or Congress is spending your money wisely. The Pentagon says they're too big to be audited, can't balance their books. There was $100 billion unaccounted for in the budget last year. There's $5 billion the GAO found of duplicate programs. There's, I believe, 82 different programs training workers. You know, could we not dr maybe deal with one federal program training workers instead of 82 different ones doing the same thing? But this is it. The president said that raising the debt ceiling would be a mistake. But now that he's president, he's changed his mind. The hypocrisy of that, I think, is what makes Americans unhappy. The president said the same thing on war. He said no president should unilaterally go to war without congressional authority, and here we are at war in Libya with no vote in Congress. He says, well, he has a piece of paper from the United Nations. We didn't elect the United Nations. We have a constitution, and it requires that those things be debated in Congress. People are unhappy because we're not doing the people's business. We haven't had a budget here in 800 days. Do you know what? It's against the law. It's against the law not to have a budget. We haven't had a budget in 800 days, but the budget law says we shove our budget every year. We're supposed to match our appropriations bills with the budget. We're not doing it. The American people are unhappy. We are dysfunctional, but we're not doing the people's business. But we're also, we've become profligate spenders, spending money that we don't have. And really, I, I think we risk great dangers. And I would ask the question to the senator from Utah is, what's the answer? How do we get out of this when we seem to be so far apart? And even on both sides, we don't seem to be tackling the issues in a, in a way that would cause or allow for significant cuts in spending. I have a friend named Ron McMillan, lives in my hometown of Alpine, Utah. And... Um, He's the author of a number of books dealing with business negotiation, dealing with trying to figure out how you can get to compromise. That series of books, the uh, crucial conversation line, line of books, one of the things that he encourages people to do is to find whatever common ground they can reach. I think there is common ground among the American people generally that we should balance our budget. Not everyone agrees about how we balance the budget, what should be cut, but they do agree that we should balance it. That being the case, that's where we ought to focus our efforts, is on amending our law of laws, that 224-year-old document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. Change it, again, to improve it, to restrict Congress's borrowing power. The plan proposed by the Democrats that's now about to come before us puts our budgeting process on autopilot, doesn't require another budget for two years, preserving the ability of Obamacare to fund itself without a single additional debate in Congress. This is wrong. This is not the right approach. I object to it for that reason. I, along with my other Republican colleagues, are prepared to vote on this and vote no on it right now. We are not the ones delaying this. President, I would say that what Americans don't like is empty partisanship. That's what's going on today. The Democrats are standing up and beating their chest and saying, Republicans won't let us have a vote. It's untrue. I've offered to have the vote. You've seen the objection here before your own eyes. They won't vote on this. Let's dispense with the empty partisanship. Let's move forward and have a vote. And if they would let us have one amendment 
an amendment that would gradually balance the budget over seven to eight years, I'll vote for their proposal and I'll ensure enough votes that it'll pass. Thank you, Mr. President.